Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Tending to You. Tending to You provides mobile bartenders and waitstaff for private events in the greater Houston area. Learn more at tendingtoyou.com. That's tending, the number two, and the letter U, dot com. This week on Meet and 3, we bring you stories about how Gen Z is different from their millennial predecessors through the lens of food. My knowledge of alcohol didn't really come from like Bud Light commercials or like Project X. Yeah, and that's my gripe with the platform as well, is that all these DIY videos, cooking videos, they're 20 seconds. What's one food item from your childhood that you wish you could have today? Dunkaroos, because they don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Although, the Dunkaroos Twitter was activated again a year ago, so it's only a matter of time. They've tweeted a couple times, it's pretty hype. Listen to Meet in 3, HRN's food news and storytelling roundup, wherever you get your podcasts. Well, hello. Welcome to All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network. I'm your host, Sherry Bayer, and it is Wednesday, August 5th, 2020. This is the 260th episode of this series, which is dedicated to behind-the-scenes talent in the hospitality industry. Today, my guest is a wonderful chef and restaurateur who has his hands in many exciting projects, and I will introduce him fully in a moment. First, as I do in every show, I will start out with my PR tip, and then later we will have my speed round game, industry news discussion, solo dining experience, and the final question. As the founder of Bayer Public Relations, I'm going to tip the show off with my PR tip of the week. So today's tip is to accept new challenges. Be willing to try something new, and perhaps even something that you're typically afraid of, pushing yourself beyond your own comfort zone. Why, you may ask? Well, when we face our fears and overcome them, the reward is priceless. There's simply nothing like a victory for you, yourself. So when presented with a challenge, accept it and say yes, believing that what you'll find on the other side will be very worth it. That's my tip today. Now, I'm very excited to have my guest joining me. It is Akhtar Nawab. He is the chef and owner of Alta Kalidad in Brooklyn, Otra Vez in New Orleans, and Prathers on the Alley in DC. He's also the founding partner and CEO of Hospitality HQ, a creative consulting and management group which offers bespoke solutions for culinary-driven concepts across the country. Actor is also a contributing chef at Cook Unity's Creators Club and the author of his first book, Good For You, Bold Flavors with Benefits, with Chronicle Books, and that's going to be released this month. So hi, Akhtar. Welcome to the show. Hi. It's been forever. I'm glad that we can catch up finally. I know. And I was thinking about the last time I saw you, and I was it when we were in Atlanta? We ran into <laughs> to each other at the Food and Wine Festival? I know, it was that long ago. It was a couple of years ago, I think. I know, that's crazy. Um, well, this is this is a great excuse to catch up and hear everything you're up to. And I can't believe everything you're up to, actually. 
<laughs> yeah, um, we're doing a lot. We're doing a lot. Just yeah, go. seriously, busy. So, um, before we get it, dive into what the current projects you're working on, uh, can you take us back a little bit to maybe just growing up and and what initially interested you into getting into the hospitality industry and becoming a chef? Sure. Uh, I, I mean, as you know, it's not that easy, I guess, with me because I was born in, you know, family from India. Um, my mom and dad are both from India. My brother was born there as well. Um, and I was born in Milwaukee and, um, and then raised in, um, raised in, in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and I stayed there for, I would say, till I was about 18, then left, or 17, then left for college and came and went away to Bradley University for a year and then returned uh, to, to Louisville and I started cooking there. So I was about just, uh, I was 20, I think I was 20. And uh, I was cooking in Louisville, Kentucky, and I kind of, I don't know, it wasn't like, a, it, it was a family-oriented restaurant that was very busy. And um, and I guess I, I really kind of got energized by working with a, a team and a group of people for, you know, a common goal that I guess I hadn't really ever had that before because, you know, I wasn't very motivated by, by schoolwork and, and kind of those studies. And that was definitely difficult for my family, um, particularly my father, who um, really, really anticipated I would end up either practicing business more formally, I should say, than I do now, or um, or or a doctor or something along that line. And uh, I really just couldn't see myself um, doing that. And when I got involved in in uh, in cooking, I really found something I think that I was missing and, and filled a gap for me for sure, creatively, uh, mentally, and then also, you know, kind of in my, my soul, I felt good doing it. Um, but that said, it was difficult. Um, you know, I chose a path and a course that isn't really scripted in any way, as you know, you deal with a lot of chefs, but there's no real, there's no real kind of um, roadmap in a way. It's just you try and you try and you try and you try to end up where you need to be. You envision yourself in a certain place, but it certainly is very difficult to get there. Um, and I think that that's really the journey, you know, that I've been on for the last, you know, now 25 years about. Yeah, well, what led you to New York? And I know you you worked with Tom Colicchio, you were at Gramercy Tavern, Craft Bar, and Craft. Um, um, I was working in San Francisco. I went to culinary school there. I met Loretta Keller, who is, you know, w would end up being my, my mentor if I had to choose one, um, and uh, also a very good friend. And I, I wanted to get to New York. You know, San Francisco had had definitely what I was looking for when I got there, and it kind of was in the moment, um, or the later side of its kind of moment with Alice Waters and that cooking. Um, and I really benefited from working at Bizu at the time with Loretta because she has so much of that same experience that I was looking for. And then when it kind of ran its course, I guess, I, I looked in New York and, and Loretta Loretta said, you need to go check out Gramercy Tavern. Um, it's really amazing what they're doing. And, and I flew out there and, and I checked it out and I was just kind of astonished that there was a restaurant that was kind of this big, this busy. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't know that I've ever seen um, kind of that personality that Tom Colicchio could kind of put on each of his plates and his dishes. And it was really remarkable to me to see how it translated from that chef to the plate um, and the cooking and, and the cooks and the techniques and the way it all flowed. And, and it, it was really just remarkable. I'd never seen that before. Um, and so I actually didn't end up trailing anywhere else. I just went there and I asked him for a job and, 
and he said, call me when you get in town, you know, or like come back when you get in town. And I think he gets approached by so many people all the time. Um, he just said, come back when you get in town. I got back in town. I, I got an apartment. I didn't have a job, but you know, I kind of moved out here right away. And then I showed up and I said, I'm here I'm looking for a job, you know? Uh, and it, it kind of all went from there. And I, I just kind of stuck with it and, and I was approaching two and a half years and he was opening craft and I wanted to do it very badly. Um, so he offered me a position at craft, um, as kind of a junior sous chef to Marco. And I was very young at the time and, and, uh, you know, was under Benno, under Marco, and that was great for me. And I was exactly where I wanted to be. Um, you know, ever since then, you know, I guess I've had other opportunities, but I was very content working at Kraft and, and, and then at Kraft Bar for, you know, five years. Um, well, and in, in, in your longer bio, I know uh, Kraft received three stars from the New York Times while you were there and won a James sure. Beard Award for Best New Restaurant. So it did. It's no, not- it did. That was very exciting. Like, it was a very exciting time to be a part of all that. And to see, yeah, yeah just, I, I mean, everyone was kind of like, we were all so excited to be at work every day back then. And it was, it was nice and it was very pure and it was just fueled by cooking great food. And obviously there's a camaraderie that kind of comes along with that and having, you know, Karen Damasco and, 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 and Damon Wise and Marco and Benno and Dave Chang and all these guys who were working there and all these people that were there and it was just, it was just really exciting and and I hadn't had that before so yeah and then you went on to to open some have some other projects in New York with the EU and Eleteria which I remember dining at um and and how how did this I mean in La La Esquina like how did you what grabbed you about Mexican cuisine because I know Um, you you know you now you now are um, primarily, that's what you're primarily cooking. Um, you know, so I, I, I left Craft Bar to, to start focusing on, on raising money and opening my own place as kind of we were all young chefs were kind of taught to do. You work for someone great and then you take all you can and you go raise money and, and you either have it internally, family, or you raise it. And we, ra- we raised it and we raised, you know, a little bit of money. We opened Altaria at a, a terrible time. Um, but at the same time, it was, it wasn't the right time for me either. Like I I didn't have the business knowledge you needed to have, um, or anyone needs to have to open their own place to to be able to afford to make mistakes. You know, we operate even now really without a, a very big safety net. You know, we've definitely created, um, when I mean a safety net, I mean a huge backer, you know, like fortunately we've been very I would say successful in what we're doing. So we've definitely carved a, a place out for ourselves. Um, but we, we operate very mindfully even now. Um, but at the time, Melitaria was, was everything I wanted to cook, but it just wasn't right. You know, I, I got a lot of mis- I, I made so many mistakes in there. And um, after it closed and I was kind of facing that, that same thing you've probably seen with a lot of chefs where, you close the restaurant, but you don't really close just the restaurant. You also, you also kind of lose your identity in the process because as culinary professionals or as chefs or as, you know, creative people, you know, we're often perceived by what people think of us as, which is our restaurants or our food and not really as the person that we are. And even I kind of didn't know that who I was really, I knew what I was working for. And I knew that I was working toward being better and whatever kind of accolades, goals, things like that were out there, but it wasn't really focusing on the right things, I think. And when I closed the restaurant, I really, you know, I was very depressed. Uh, I was in a terrible spot. Um, and when I wanted to go back to cooking, I said, I would do anything other than going back and cooking this refined, uh, ambitious kind of yeah. cooking. And I was like, I will do anything besides that. 
and it didn't matter what i was open to anything and mexican through like a headhunter actually approached me and asked me if i would be interested and i said i don't know anything about this food um other than i like it and they were looking for a manager as you know like they had a clientele and they were busy and and but they didn't have any sort of management in the back of the house and and that's really what they were seeking and i told uh, this guy james and i said james you know like I, you know like i i hate to interview like this but i got to be honest i don't know anything about this food and he's like you know what if you're interested you'll learn and and he was right he was right about that and i kind of went into it with a very humble um kind of position which is i didn't even know as much about the food as the cooks who were there i didn't know more than they did um and i just got very comfortable working with this new set of ingredients over the course of four years and then i i really started feeling passionate toward it um and now i really miss it i crave it if i don't get it often so it it was really kind of an organic uh, thing that occurred and and i guess i've always been kind of cognitive of, of exactly that yeah well i didn't i mean that's it's amazing because you've gone on to open open uh alta calidad and 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 otra vez and you know cooking cooking mexican cuisine and what i mean i've and i've i i miss i miss your cooking i have to say i, I want to come out to brooklyn um what's so so what's um just to jump ahead a little bit i mean with your experience opening your own place I, what when did you open in brooklyn and and then how's it been um i mean up until we hit into covid and then the changes right. you've been going through i know that's uh, a we, lot <laughs> yeah, no it's a lot no it is but you know to to answer the first part you know we opened in 2016 and and it was mostly because you know i i had some other kind of consulting projects I was working on, but they were kind of tapering off at the same time. And I wasn't really interested in, in pursuing, um, pursuing them any longer anyway. And, and, uh, this friend of mine, Michael came to me and said, I, I found this really great spot in Brooklyn and it's, it's, it's pretty small. Um, and the rent is totally reasonable. Um, and I went and saw it and it's on this great corner. It used to be a very good, ramen shop called Chuko um, for many years and, and they were super successful and they moved down the street and and when we took it over a lot of it was because I knew I could control everything I needed to and you know I was still very tender to be honest about opening a restaurant of this kind of caliber again I, I you know I think I'll always be a little timid after kind of getting getting so beaten up over the first closure um, and remembering so clearly where that put me emotionally and, and, and financially afterwards yeah, and mentally and mentally too, you know, and I was very cautious not to revisit it. So, you know, since then I've, I've developed a very, very close relationship with my daughter and, and I didn't want to jeopardize that no matter what, because I knew how much it took to to build that to what it is now. Um, and there's no quicker way to ruin it than to be absent, you know? Um, so I was very, very, you know, I was highly aware of, of, the, of, of what I was doing. And I, I, I went to her and I, I asked her, I, I asked her, I said, Ella, do you mind if I, I open this place? You know, like, I kind of feel like I want to cook a little more freely again. And she said she didn't mind. And that was enough for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well. The, yeah, and then to the to the second part you were asking about, you know, we didn't we didn't open that restaurant with any intention other than cooking good food, and it was interesting that like you know we picked up a couple of Michelin nods, um, and those were not ever even never crossed my mind. Like it never ever we were never shooting for reviews or anything i just wanted to go there and cook the creative things that were on my mind at the time um and hopefully people would like it and they would go there um and you know that's worked out well i think for us so far so 
Um, yeah. So COVID comes along and no one's expecting this pandemic. Um, how, how have you been dealing? How did you, as the, the key, the word everyone's using pivot, um, how did you pivot? Right. Where are you now? Um, you know, how's it going? Um, we, Obviously, you know, we, we just like everybody, we we're kind of stand, standing there one day when 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 we got this news about um, closures and we we're just all standing in the restaurant. We're like, kind of like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Like, this is crazy. Um, and I guess we felt the right thing to do was to close. Um, and then, you know, like everyone, we, we packed up a bunch of things and went home and stayed there. Uh, close the restaurant and then when uh when i guess when we felt a little more comfortable as much as we can right now we reopened for just kind of takeout and delivery and we shifted our model to um a little more um kind of family style dinner type things that we would offer on on certain days uh, a couple of large format things and then the things that people really wanted from us which were tacos and a few other dishes um, and you know, the, the, we built a pretty big deck outside that, that can accommodate, you know, probably our, with our patio and the deck accommodate as many as we would see it inside right now. But fortunately we were just approved for some outdoor, um, outdoor city, uh, street dining for kind of hopefully the remainder of the summer and September, hopefully, um, it would actually give us a, a fair shot at making enough money to um, maybe, I, I guess, make it through the next round yeah. of closures, closures, which seem inevitable right now. So, Yeah, no, it's so hard. It's so hard. And then when we have a storm like we did yesterday, it's like, uh, it's it's so hard with this. It's been I mean, a lot. Yeah. I mean, listen, we, we're pretty confident as everyone is. You know, I listened to Dave Chang this morning as well. And, you know, the next round of closures, I think, are it's inevitable. Um, it's only so long before people it's too cold for people to eat outside. Um, and then what happens, you know? So obviously no one knows. There are no answers. Yeah. Um, but so so you got involved with this, the Creators Club um, uh, by Cook Unity. Um, do you want to talk a little about that? I was, I was, I was on your platform, and it's very, very user friendly. I have to say. Yeah, no, they're good. Those guys. Uh, we we like to, I like those guys. Um, so Lonnie Sweet, who is someone I do a lot of work with. Um, He's been on my show. I know Lonnie. Yeah. Okay. He, he, I, I I figured, and I thought so. Yeah. Uh, Lonnie's great. a great guy, and we we. Uh, we do, we're trying to find as much work as we can together because I think we like working together. And, uh, and he makes me laugh and that's difficult. Most people can't do that. Um, and we were talking about different revenue streams and he, pre he presented this and I said, you know what, that's really interesting. I would be totally into the idea of, of doing this because I can do a lot of it centered around the cookbook that's coming out and and a lot of the dishes that we're doing there are things that are either in or derived from the cookbook uh and it gave me a good platform to do it and, and after i met the owner um he's, he he seems very committed to to his concept and his 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 idea um and he approached me by doing it and it's been going very well. It's a couple of weeks of kind of figuring our way, but they were very supportive in the process. And uh, ever since then, we've just kind of, we've been putting up good numbers. So it's been a good added kind of revenue stream during this down period. And, you know, we're doing a lot more of that kind of stuff in general as we are going through this. Yeah, I think I think that's great. Um, the, the the food options available with all the chefs involved, um, including yourself. I mean, this looks like I want to order. I mean, it's very it's very um, it's very well done. I think um, without having tried it, but it's gotten it's gotten tempted me to try it. So, right. Um, well, I think you should. I, I I mean, I know you like to eat healthfully. Yeah. Um, I know I know it, and I think the things we're doing are 
are really delicious and they're kind of designed for just popping it in the microwave or, or warming it gently in the oven, whatever you prefer. Um, and, and just like super tasty and they're kind of, you know, on the low carb side, although not kind of carbohydrate free, but it's all dairy free. It's all gluten free. And it, I don't know, it just kind of you feel good after you eat it, which I think is always nice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think I'm going to have to try it. Say good for you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So, so let me ask you my, my question from my previous guest on, on episode 259 I had on Gary Obligacion. He's the general manager at Post Ranch Inn in Big Sur. And he wants to know, what did you discover as a chef through COVID that maybe you didn't expect to or that surprised you? Um, what tapped or that tapped into your own heritage being um, on the Indian side with Mexican food and then um, that you've explored and to fully help carry you through this COVID, COVID, post COVID era. I just made up a word, COVID. I don't know what I said. Post COVID era. I'll tell you, you know, it really, it really makes you look deep in, into your because like, you know, your customers and your, your clientele has really been slashed by, you know, so, so much, you know, most restaurants are doing, I know some are doing 0% and some are doing 15% and some of the better ones are doing 50 to 60%, but it's all at a lesser rate. You know what I mean? So I think it really forces you to look inside and say, why did you start doing this in the first place? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it really does force and. Uh, you know, a, a true kind of introspective look on on who you are, why you're doing it. And ultimately, you know, we do this because we like to take care of people and we do it through food. You know, my partner, Michael, does it through, you know, more interaction, you know. Um, and then I think the, the kind of the, the more, as I've seen kind of across the board, everyone wants more homey, cooking and and I at home I find myself cooking a lot more Indian food during during this downtime because you know rice and lentils is something I, I honestly I feel like I could eat every day um, and never really get tired of it um, and then the Mexican side is of me which I often find is like split right down the center you know just finds its way into this Indian food a lot with the chilies and 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 makes me kind of rethink our menus at the restaurant and how we can keep them fresh even through this down period you know so we changed our shrimp taco it's more like the salsa that we we make with you know cumin and allspice but then we roast the chilies and it, it has this real indian korma kind of aspect to it and we we toss it with the shrimp i don't know it's really really tasty and homey and makes me want to put it put it on a taco or put it on rice and, and eat it right away. So um, I guess it's just kind of forced you to look inside internally quite a lot. Yeah, that makes sense. And you're making me hungry. Uh, <laughs> what, um, so before we take a break, let's talk a little about Hospitality HQ because, sure. you know, I didn't, I only learned of yesterday that two days ago you opened a food hall in Chicago. <laughs> uh, that's true. We did, and we have actually five more, um, five more in the pipeline right now. I mean, well, I mean that's amazing. But I mean, so you're op What's it like opening now? And and this the idea of of the food hall. I mean, um, sure. In this, I was thinking, and did was I was thinking about design and and everything that everyone's going through now with social distancing and um you know where where were you at with opening it were you able to um create the space that you know without having to like go backwards in in planning right. or um well, how did yeah how did it's actually go? it's 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 a i find this like kind of remarkable because it's actually really counterintuitive in a way but it's I, the more I've talked about it and now doing it it's been very interesting the whole process but you know we were fortunate enough in Chicago to have this happen before we open by four months 
you know? Yeah. And we were fortunate that it gave us an opportunity to take a step back and examine what it was we were doing there. And ultimately, you know, the food hall is an experiential place. You know, I don't know that New York necessarily does it, um, but the food halls here in, in the way that I would say I love, you know, like there are other places, but ideally it should be a great place to get great food from artisanal, you know, vendors who have, or, or restaurant owners who have, you know, a message or something to say that, you know, are going to be there present, counted for in cooking. Um, however, we also have the space, unlike a restaurant, to spread out um, the floor plan in a way that, that restaurants and typical brick and mortars can't do. So we're, we're toying around with 10,500 square feet inside and about 1,500 square feet outside. That actually still gives us, with the diminished capacities, enough space to, to manage the crowd and stay open and these vendors a lot of them have lost businesses um, as you can imagine through this crisis and a lot of them who had businesses that were ready to open weren't able to open them and a lot of them were facing kind of forthcoming closures so the food hall becomes a really good inexpensive way for them to be able to stay working stay afloat still do what they love to do and hopefully take care of the people they need to. And, and that's really our objective, you know, with the food hall. Well, it's great. I think, I mean, it's amazing that you have that in Chicago and I think you also have one in, in Omaha uh, and do. more, yeah. as you said, <laughs> coming. Yeah, we do. We have several more Yeah, Houston soon and in Portland, Maine soon. And these are, you know, Portland, Maine is, something I'm like super excited about because I just happen to really like it there. Um, then we have, we have a couple of other ones coming up that are in very fun cities, you know, but they're far enough away that I think it gives us a little, a little breathing room. Yeah. Well, that's good. Okay. We're going to take a break. Um, and then come back. We'll have my speed round. We'll have industry news, my solo dining experience and the final question. Before we do, I have a special announcement. So uh, Nyman Ranch is presenting a virtual event series honoring their community of independent family farmers in lieu of their 22nd annual Hog Farmer Appreciation Dinner, which couldn't take place in person this year. The series of educational events is, is happening now. It will continue through September 11th, and it includes panels such as a chef panel on restaurant resilience, a Nyman Ranch farmer panel, and one on the future of grocery retail. Um, our very own Kat Johnson of Heritage Radio moderated a panel this morning on uh, the future of restaurants, and I tuned in. It was great, and it's going to be broadcast on HRN on tour on Heritage Radio sometime later this year. And uh, if you want more details and to reserve your spot, please go to Nyman Ranch HFAD. Dot com and that stands for Hog Farmer Appreciation Dinner. So again, that's Nyman Ranch HFAD.com. And we'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Tending to You. Tending to You provides mobile bartenders and waitstaff for private events in the greater Houston area. Their dedicated and capable team specializes in traditional sit-down gatherings, past appetizer service, buffet-style meals, and bartending refreshing customized cocktails and beverages. They provide all their own tools needed for a pop-up bar, including drinkware, garnishes, napkins, and more to be set up for success. They also come equipped with trays, gloves, and cleaning products, which allows Tending to You to provide a superior level of service. Learn more at tendingtoyou.com. That's tending, the number two, and the letter u.com.
Welcome back to All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network. I'm your host, Sherry Bayer. My guest today is Akhtar Nawab. He is the chef and owner of Alta Kalidad, Otra Vase, and Prathers on the Alley. He's also the founding partner and CEO of Hospitality HQ and a chef of Cook Unity's Creators Club. So Akhtar, what this is coming up, my speed round game, uh, is I ask you uh, I ask you to choose between a few preferences between between a few choices such as chocolate or vanilla and you get to pick your preference okay okay so here we go ready ready i know you're ready (laughs) i didn't even give you my sample chocolate or vanilla i knew you just got it got it that's how yeah that's that's how much i think things through i guess okay well here we go eat in or eat out eat in Wine, beer, cocktail, mocktail, or champagne? Cocktail. Tasting menu or a la carte? A la carte. Small plates or large plates? Small. Communal table or chef's counter? Chef's corner. Tipping or all-inclusive charge? All-inclusive. How about chia baked salmon or a lamb kebab turmeric hummus? Chia salmon. I was eyeing both of those. Yeah, I'm working on getting the the king salmon, but right now it's chia chia wild salmon, but I want the chia wild king salmon soon. Awesome. Um, Okay, I have three more. Food halls or traditional restaurants? Hmm. I finally stumped you. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one because I'm so motivated by what we're doing. But um, I, I would, I would say uh, that's a tough one. All right, I'll let you pass on that one. <laughs> I, I'm just so into what we're doing, but I, yeah. you know, I love what we do in Brooklyn too. You know, um, so sometimes my, my restaurant heart is split down the middle on this stuff because I, I love seeing what these vendors are doing. It's amazing. Like whether they're making dumplings or barbecue or whatever it is, and seeing these people at their best is amazing. But I also like doing it myself in my place. <laughs> so, well, that makes sense. Okay, my last two are cheese plate or dessert. Cheese plate. Manhattan or Brooklyn or New Orleans or DC or Chicago or Omaha or Portland. I have to throw in there now. <laughs> Um, it's New York because it's Manhattan because my daughter's here with me. Ah, uh, that's nice. Otherwise, it would be Portland, I think. Okay, well, well, that's that's great. You you did very well at this game. You played. You were very fast. Okay. Um, even though there's there there's no there's no right or wrong or um, or prize besides that you get to now talk some mm-hmm. industry news with me. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. Okay, good. So I picked out an article that was in Esquire uh, by Jeff Gordonaire, and the title is, The Real Reason I Miss Restaurants Has Nothing to Do With the Food. If this pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we don't go out because we're hungry. We go out because we're lonely. Um, I, I I have to say, I, I I definitely agree with Jeff, even though the food... We do, I do go out for the food. It's not, it. I mean, I think I've always said it's uh, food service and ambiance. You need them all to, to, to make, you know, to, to really uh, make make it or make make me feel, feel happy in that sense of um, it's a combination. But I, I get that we go out to eat beyond what's on the plate, that it's to be social and around people. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you saw this piece or have a, have uh, a take I got on it. Through, yeah, I couldn't get through all of it, but I got through most of it. And yeah. I tend to agree. Like, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say lonely as much as it is, uh, you know, I, I guess to me, lonely indicates like you're, you're craving or in need of attention in some way. And I guess when I, when I think about kind of this, this perspective it is definitely that you want to be around others and i agree with that but you know that also goes for like i miss seeing live music you know what i mean or 
my daughter misses going to see a movie, but you don't really go to a theater to go see it by yourself. You, you go because there's a group of people who are also feeling that and, and, and kind of together that energy is, is, is what kind of people need that togetherness. And it could be working out. It could be, you know, like, I used to love going to these boxing classes and they're all canceled for who knows three years, whatever it's going to be. But, you know, it was a fun way for me to, um, to work out a couple of times a week, you know what I mean? So I, I, I do agree, you know, I guess to, to an extent that, um, people do, do go, do go do that because they're seeking to be around others, you know? Yeah, and I agree with you because I mean I read this and I you know started thinking about it more, and as someone who dines out and a lot by myself and sure. has traveled around the world by myself, I'm I'm comfortable being alone and doing that. Sure. But the thing is, I'm not. You're not really alone. That's I think that's why I go to a restaurant because even if I'm by myself, then I'm surrounded by people, and even if I don't talk to anyone beyond the server it's still there's something about it that um that makes you feel or me feel like comforted in a different way than i am if i'm eating by myself in my apartment right no i agree i agree with that i no, i i, I get it i i do feel similarly you know that said i haven't I, I think i've had two meals in restaurants in four months you know what I mean? Yeah. One was, one was in Chicago because we were there opening this place. So we all went somewhere um, that could be outside, for example. Um, and the other was for Ella's birthday in, 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 on, in July 15th. And, and that was, that's been it. And I haven't necessarily missed um, eating in restaurants as much as I have cooking in mind. Um, that, that's been a, a difficult adjustment. You know, so I am cooking at home a lot, but I do miss I do miss being able to to cook in that capacity where it's just it's just there and it's what I want to do. And, and I mean, obviously, there's home, but uh, I, I I am missing that for sure. Yeah, well, I could see that too. I mean, it's yeah, it's different cooking in a restaurant than just cooking at home. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll see. I I'm. I've been dining out uh, a bit uh, as places are opening, but not, I mean, not not at all like I used to. I mean, it's been few and far between, but that will be my segue into my solo dining experience this week uh, because I went to Mercado Little Spain, so. Yeah, yeah, how was it? So I'm gonna give, uh, it was great. I mean, I'll give a rundown of it. Um, the location, 10, Hudson Yards, the shops at and restaurants at Hudson Yards, New York City. The concept, it's a sprawling Spanish food market with restaurants and kiosks, and it's now open for takeout delivery and outdoor dining. The chefs and owners are Jose Andres, Albert Adria, and Ferran Adria. So why did I go? Well, because it's Jose and the Adria brothers. I mean, that's good enough reason, uh, of course. So my experience, um, this was last Friday night. I was biking around the city, which has become kind of my mode of transportation and, and also my new hobby. <laughs> um, and I, I, I didn't have a plan and I kind of spontaneously ended up there realizing they had opened up for outdoor dining. Um, so, so when I got there, they, they had some outside seating, but I was in my gym clothes. I just kind of wanted to take something to go. Um, they had a sign saying you could order, you could scan the, the menu and order. It was easiest to order online. So I just stood there. I did that. I scanned the menu. I ordered off my phone. I took a little walk. It said my food would be ready about 15 minutes. I, I came back. I got my bag. And then I actually started eating on these high top tables that they had set up for self-serve. Uh, so what did I get? I had the Popo a la Galega, which is their boiled Spanish octopus with mashed potatoes. And I had a, the Bikini Mixto, which is a bocadillo, a grilled ham and cheese sandwich. My take? Delicious. I mean, the octopus, which I hadn't had in, in months because I just not not in my diet during this pandemic, even though I used to eat a lot of octopus. So it was nice to right. have it. 
and it was bathed in this in these mashed potatoes it was just it was it was quite heavenly i have to say um and the sandwich was this large large grilled sandwich um and it was good to have the bread to go with it i mean it was it was a nice combo i guess a kind of a weird combo i made but i enjoyed it uh the ambiance is the qu a quaint street on the south side of hudson yards uh, perfect for anyone who wishes to travel to spain to eat but is currently in new york city Interesting tidbit, Mercado Little Spain also has some do-it-yourself kits they're offering online, and Jose, our hero Jose, his World Central Kitchen is working across the country to safely distribute individual pa packaged fresh meals in communities that need support, and they're currently providing 150,000 me fresh meals every day, which is just incredible. It's amazing. It really is. Um, yeah. So my personal fun fact is during, during the time I was waiting for my food, I walked across the street. There's a, a brand new Whole Foods that have, has opened up. So I gave myself a little tour. And let me tell you, this Whole Foods is, is quite amazing. It's, it's very spacious. They had some new different counters like a matcha bar and, and just the meat and the cheese. I don't know. It's like my, my friend matcha full, that's Hannah. Uh, oh she, really? Yeah, yeah. You know each other. She's great, amazing. Oh, that's awesome. That's on the first floor. It wasn't open uh, then, but and then everything else is pretty much on the second floor. Um, it was awesome. I bought a fancy water. They have self checkout now there. Um, yeah. If I, I mean, this is, I get excited <laughs> about supermarkets yeah. still. So um, it's a great Whole Foods if you're in the neighborhood. Uh, the cost of my meal at Little Spain was $28. That's not including tax and gratuity. Would I go back? Yes, of course. Their website is littlespain.com. And also, side note, I don't think anything else is currently open in Hudson Yards. I mean, it's everything else has been enclosed in the giant mall, so it's great they have the outdoor space. Um, so that's, that's my latest uh, dining experience. Okay. I, like I think food's good. Yeah, you can't go wrong there, I don't think. Um, no, it was good. Cool. So my next guest is Kelly Fields. She is the chef and owner of Willa Jean in New Orleans. Uh, she's debuting her first cookbook, The Good Book of Southern Baking, a revival of biscuits, cakes, and cornbread. So Actar. Uh, can you please ask a question for Kelly? And I wonder, with your New Orleans presence, if you guys um, know each other. So my my apartment in New Orleans is above her restaurant, so I eat here <laughs> more than anywhere else in New Orleans. Wow. Um, <laughs> I figured you knew her, but I didn't know you lived upstairs. I live upstairs. So I actually... Um, uh, her 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 employee who works who works at the cashier typically knows exactly how I like my coffee. They're really great in there, and the food's great. Um, I love how it feels in there. The energy's always great, um, and she's just so impressive. And it's always great to to see her whenever uh, we're at an event or <clears throat> outside the restaurant. I know she's always very busy, um, so I really do eat there all the time um, and get coffee there every day that I'm there. Unfortunately, my restaurant in New Orleans has yet to uh, reopen as we're trying to figure out how to do so, like we were talking about earlier. <clears throat> um, that one's been hit fairly hard for us, just like so many others. Yeah, I'm sorry. But we're trying to figure it out. And that's okay. We're, we're fortunately, our partners there um, are the same partners that, that you know, she has in her building. And, um, and they're very committed to us and we are to them. So. We're, we're hopeful we're going to figure it out. Um, it's just taking taking us a little while to do so. Um, my my uh, Since I eat at the restaurant fairly regularly, I would say my question is a little less about the restaurant business and more for me to understand how she makes her pimento spread or the pimento cheese because it is so good. It's so good. I don't know all of what's in it, but I would like to know. Maybe it's in the book. Um, maybe it is. Well, well, I'll, we'll have to find out. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So I, I will ask her and thank you. Um, I wish we had more time. There's there's so much more we could talk about and uh, you're, you're amazing. I, I don't know how you're doing everything you're doing and I wish you the best in, in getting through this time and, and just much success in the Thanks. future. And I can't wait to see you and have your food again. I can't, can't wait to see you in person. Hopefully we'll get you a copy of the book. Um, good for you. And you'll cook from it and maybe we can talk about it again soon. Yeah, I know. And I saw Andrea Strong was your co-writer. Andrea is amazing. She, we've known each other forever. And so we thought we would do this together and she was wonderful, as you know. Um, and she knows me so well, so it made it that much easier to to, to write this book and she knows I've been playing bass guitar since I was a kid and how impactful that is for me even these days so she was able to work all of those things in there too wow it's amazing I can't wait to see the book so that's that's great thank you well thank you my okay. guest today has been Akhtar Nawab. He's the chef and owner of Alta Kalidad, of Otraves, and of Prathers on the Alley. He's the founding partner and CEO of Hospitality HQ. He's a chef at Cook Unity's Creators Club, and he has a new book out, so you all get it. <laughs> um, his website, he's got a bunch. Uh, he's got akhtarnawab.com, hospHQ.com, um, eat.cookunity.com. Uh, altakalidadbk.com and utrevesnola.com and you can follow him on social media at Chef Akhtar and at HospHQ uh, you can follow me at Sherry Bayer at Bayer PR at All Industry my Facebook page is All in the Industry my websites are BayerPublicRelations.com SherryBayer.com and All in the Industry.com all of our shows are archived at HeritageRadioNetwork.org we are also on iTunes, Stitcher and Spotify Thanks to my engineer today, Amanda Wang, and thanks again to Akhtar. I'm Sherry Bayer. I am not going to be back here live with you uh, until September 9th with Kelly Fields, but for the next two shows, I'm going to be playing back my panels, the panels we had at Host Summit Plus Social, the conference I did earlier this year. And so stay tuned for that. It's going to be two episodes, one from our morning session and one from our afternoon session. And I'm excited uh, to share it with, with everyone. And we're also going to be putting uh, our videos up online so you can stay tuned for that. Um, so again, I'll be back on September 9th with Kelly Fields because we also we have a summer break here at Heritage Radio. And um, till then, stay well, stay safe, and thank you for being part of All in the Industry. Bye. All in the Industry is powered by Simplecast. I'm Sherry Bayer, and you're listening to Heritage Radio Network, a member-supported podcast network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. This year, HRN is celebrating 10 years of food radio. For the past decade, we've been taking you behind the scenes of farms, restaurants, breweries, school cafeterias, and more. It's been 10 years, and we're just getting started. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know 
not only what I'm eating, but then like how how that all came to be, and realize like wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen; it's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.